Boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, Jesse Warden here. Tonight we're gonna do refactoring part two. The wonderful thing about closures in JavaScript is that they enclose functionality. That's what they're called closures or enclosing. They have the ability to see their variables locally, but they could also hop out up here and use those. They kind of fall in and enclose that. And these functions keep enclosing things and they can be run later and still have that reference or state. The challenge becomes later when you want to modify those things deep inside those closures to see how it works. You only have three options. A, run a bunch of tests. B, use something like Sanan to mock it. Or C, you can refactor it to be testable. So what we're going to do tonight is refactor one of those functions that does a lot. Take the classes out of it. This could be in normal functions that have nothing to do with classes, object-oriented programming. It's really just a function that does a lot and doesn't expose a way for us to modify how that works. And the way you do that in a normal programming is called parameters. So we're gonna put a bunch of parameters on that function to expose how it actually works internally. And the reverse, since it does a lot internally, we are going to expose how the results of those operations internally so we know what's going on. It helps us debug, helps us verify results, makes it easier to test. It's doing a lot, we have to test a lot. We're gonna continue refactoring this class even more, this attack method that does a series of steps we're gonna make each step testable. So we've already got the roll dice. So let's start on a shell, a replacement for this attack method. Take this to the very top and we'll put our shell here. But we're gonna use this function right here as a guide. First up, we need a roll dice function. So we're gonna pass that in. Second, we need to know the actual strength of the attacker. So we're just passing the attacker's strength for now. And we also need to know the armor bonus and the dexterity of the target. So we'll say target armor bonus, target dexterity. And for now, that's it. We can bake some of the other rules, such as knowing that you're only allowed between 1 and 20 for attack rolls. That's fine. Those kind of rules are inherent into the system, and it's okay to not make it 100% pure. We have enough parameters here to configure this to work in a more easily configured fashion. We've got the roll dice. Let's change that right now to be roll dice. And we'll take in the 1d20 function. One thing we're missing is the optional third parameter. Let's go ahead and add that here. We'll say the random number generator. We'll add that as the third parameter. Adding of the strength is actually from the attacker strength. So no more this, it's just whatever we pass in. From the clamping perspective, that's fine. We can keep the actual roll that it gets clamped, not a big deal. We could expose this in case the strength does go above, but whatever these rules were put in place by the open source community around D20 rules, not me. The two hit, is, he doesn't need to be a var, he's a const. Second, this var can change, that's fine, but let's block scope it at least. So we'll use let to make sure. Lastly, we're not using targets or objects anymore. We're merely using the numbers that are passed in. So we'll do the target arm bonus. And now that we can't see these parameters, let's rotate them down just a bit here. And we'll use the target dexterity so we can actually read the parameters we're using here. Cool, so that's a, a step in the right direction. We've now got a method that takes in many configurable ways, makes it significantly easier to unit test. We can provide our own roll dice function, or we can provide our own random number rater, regardless if the existing roll dice is fine. We can provide all the numbers that are required, a lot simpler to configure, a lot easier to test. Done is expose some of the internal workings to parameters. Here, it actually takes a target and uses the entire class's internal state. Here we can do any type of attack we possibly could ever want merely by changing the parameters we pass in. Now that we've got a reasonably good start on this attack, let's go and get that roll out and start doing some prediction based on how these attacks are gonna play out. Close the attack method. We'll go into our tests up at the very top. We'll go to the bottom and we're gonna go outside to describe. This is gonna get kind of crazy here. So we're gonna go as a matter of fact, these are actually inside the person. Let's get the good stuff out of the person. So these are the fixtures. Let's get all the pure functions we're creating, put them in the bottom here. Organize it just a tad, and we'll do a describe attack. Now, sometimes I actually don't like referring to other places in the code, so I'll just actually copy paste into the unit test. And I'll like comment it out. So it's there for me to look at, and I don't have to go all over the place. Makes it easier for me to see. Now attacks should always be a hit if 20 is rolled. We're going to create a result here that is a result of the attack. The roll dice function we could use 
But even with the one, it's still kind of random. So let's just create a mock here. Let's do a roll dice function. And what does it do? It just returns 20. <laughs> so randomness aside, it's just going to return 20. And we'll use that as our roll dice function. Unlike the other roll dice function, which although it can be random, you can turn it off. This is a lot simpler to read. Roll dice, sure, dude, 20. <laughs> so it's an always hit. Okay. Next parameter, and we'll enter this to make it a little more better aligned, is when the random number generator to actually pass to this roll dice, which it'll ignore because it takes no parameters, is get not a random number. So we're a little more clear on that aspect, but we could replace this pretty easily with the real roll dice and it would still give us 20 back. Third parameter is according to our reference down here, the attacker's strength. So we're just gonna put zero because we, if you add zero to anything, it doesn't add anything or subtract. Same with armor bonus and same with dexterity. So we can guarantee we're always gonna get a 20 back, sort of. So watch this. If we just simply log out what the result is and we'll do a it that only. An algorithm like this does a lot inside and says, yes, you've gotten 20, but we don't even know what they rolled. And it would help us debug if we actually knew what was going on inside of this function. So we're gonna change the function signature just a tad to give us some understanding of what they actually rolled. Instead of rolling of a hit, we'll actually add an additional method here of hit, which is a Boolean. And then we will return an object that gives us some information on what the actual hit was. So the roll, and it, whether they hit or not as the boolean. And finally, what was the two hit number? What number did we actually have to beat? So now we get some more understanding of the exposure of what actually is happening inside of here without creating a series of predicates or observables or whatever. We just wanna know basic math and tell us what happened so we can expose it to the user. Some games will actually print out how the algorithm actually worked. So you can verify if your weapons and or armors or bonuses are working. But us as programmers, it helps us debug too and write better unit tests to verify that the internals are working. This is a trite example. Some of these will span many, many, many lines of code. And returning an object back gives you a, a nice window into the internal state of the function. We're going to use it for game development for now. So we're going to expose this object. And instead of the result here, printing out a number, we're going to rerun the function. And instead, we'll actually get an object now. So we did, in fact, roll a 20, which means our hard-coded value did, in fact, sort of work. We got a hit of true, which it should always be true because the default is always 10. 10 is always the default, regardless of whether they have armor or not. So we know exactly what works with the default rules so we can verify the initial state of our algorithm. But let's do that now. So the result that hit should be true. We run our tests and verify that the hit is in fact true. So I hope that was helpful, ladies and gentlemen. We are gonna to continue to refactor this, but even if we didn't, we've already shown you ways of exposing very complex functions and making them easier to unit test merely by exposing functions and returning more verbose results of what did you actually accomplish? So we can test if you actually did. So again, you got any other questions about this? I know refactoring is a very difficult, challenging thing to do. Unit testing is very hard to do. You're doing both at the same time. Feel free to subscribe so you can see and learn more. Drop me a comment. I'll be more than happy to answer your questions. Follow me on social media and I will see y'all this weekend. Three day weekend. Bye.